So a little bit of community news before I begin. You might want to pause here, nip into the kitchen, make yourself a cuppa. The reason being is I have a feeling this one will go a little bit longer than I had anticipated. It depends upon how much I waffle on, but there are several points I want to get across, all of which are aimed at stopping you doing something stupid and also listening to people who try and get you to do stupid things. I want to begin with a fairly obvious statement. Markets go up and markets go down. If you cannot cope with that fact, then markets are probably not for you. Because they do display this duality of psychology. Markets enable you to make money when they go up. They also enable you to lose money when those things that you have bought go down. This is just simply the nature of the game, and you have to be aware of the game that you are playing. But notice, there are two elements to this statement. Markets go up and markets go down. And it is important to understand that, particularly when you are looking at a variety of information sources. And the reason I add in that component about when you're looking at information sources is that for the past God knows how long, my social media feed has been bombarded by people predicting the end of the world. And this is from one particularly popular channel. You'll note top left, I actually dated these. So these are from 2020. And we can see from the first one, my goal is predicting a massive bear market and stocks. Must have missed that. This signal just flashed red bull market end years. And oh, bugger, I missed that one as well, didn't I? Breakout S&P 500 begins its final leg up. Yeah, I must have been asleep then, sorry. Final one, the melt-up begins. Yeah, must have had my head up my backside for that one because I missed that completely as well. When we look at the S&P 500, and these predictions pertain to US markets, since 2020, the S&P 500 has made 113 new all-time highs. So let's contrast the reality of what happened with the somewhat hyperbolic predictions of what might happen. Notice I used the word prediction. In trading, prediction is a nonsense term. Markets at present cannot be predicted in any way, shape or form. And so we come back to the reality of it. And you can see that once the S&P 500 like most markets in the world, recovered from the little COVID dump, they simply took off. And the US market has continued to take off. Even here in Australia, we push towards a new all-time high, which has been some time coming and very difficult to get to. And if we pop forward to present day, oh, we're back again. History repeats, it's back. Now, one of the things they do in these particular videos is they overlay charts of different periods, which, spoiler alert, doesn't work. And I'll point out why it doesn't work uh, in a few moments. We get nobody sees it coming. Well, I certainly didn't. 2008 will dwarf in comparison. Uh, another spoiler alert, 2008 wasn't really that bad. Final one, smart money is ex exiting. I have no idea what smart money is and never have, uh, despite decades in this business. This begins to sound somewhat like a broken record that just goes on and on and on and repeats endlessly. And you end up being like this idiot, Robert Kiyosaki, who proudly proclaimed in 2015 that he had been predicting a stock market crash in 2016 from 2002. Again, I'm not quite certain what I was looking at for the past two decades. If somebody can point me in the right direction of the supposed crashes that were going to occur, uh, let me know in the comments section. The problem with this is that it's like a busted clock, and a busted clock 
is right twice a day, simply through happenstance, not through any great predictive or analytical ability. It is simply a fluke. Unfortunately, these idiots be, end up being like the boy who cried wolf. When they are right, it's too late for everybody because the message has been so overblown and so overdone that it loses any meaning. And I will be harsh here and say that these sorts of things have no meaning. And the reason for that will become apparent in a second. So you have to ask the question as to why these sites exist, why these individuals cling to a dogmatic belief that is continually proved incorrect. I've got a few reasons as to why I think this is, and they are all unfortunately very human. The first is it generates an emotional rather than a cognitive response. It's a sales technique that appeals to a certain audience. There is always a segment of the population who believe the world will end. And this is a mechanism to engender some sort of response, some sort of emotional response that overrides any form of logic and any form of higher level analytical thinking. I'll give you a current example that I prepared whilst actually doing this presentation on the fly. And it's a headline from today. And I'll read the headline. Victorian fires live, updates, catastrophic weather warning. Pay attention to the word catastrophic. And there's a reason I want you to pay attention to the word catastrophic. And it comes with this very emotive and very powerful photograph. And this is not to downplay things like bushfires. But it is to downplay the breathless hyperbole that comes with these. And I'm quite certain if I turned on any of the commercial news networks today, that some overly pneumatically enhanced young lady would be standing in front of a map telling me the world is going to end. Uh, strangely, as I look out my window, it's actually starting to rain. Remember I said concentrate on the word catastrophic. An extremely emotive term, a very powerful term. This tracks the use of the word catastrophic in language, in headlines and the like. You'll notice since 1990, there has been a peak of the acceleration from the 1950s. It became a buzzword for describing things. And it became a buzzword for describing things that were not worthy of the word. Let me give you a little bit of a historical context. These are headlines I trolled through to find regarding the sinking of the Titanic. None of them use the word catastrophic. Yet the sinking of a liner with 1,500 dead is catastrophic. But they didn't use the word because there was not that need to compete for attention back then. So when you look at sites that proclaim all sorts of headlines like these, it's attention seeking. It's the sort of thing children do when they show off. They are actually attention seeking. And the same thing occurs when one begins to look at modern media. They're competing. They're competing for attention. People's attention spans are now appalling. They're on the level of a goldfish. And so you have to do something to grab them. Hence the title of this video, The World Will End. Eventually, and eventually it will. But probably not today. The other point as to why people do this is that traders often start with a conclusion in mind and then work backwards. They're not looking to establish an initial hypothesis and test it. They already have the conclusion in mind and they look for data to confirm it. So for them, confirmation bias is their default setting. This is a little bit like when people ask for your opinion. They're not asking for your opinion. They're asking you to agree with what they've already come up with as their opinion. 
They don't want variant perception, yet in trading, variant perceptions are enormously important. This notion of people think differently to me, what might they be thinking? This comes back to an important sort of psychological landmark that many humans miss out on. Many humans don't have a theory of mind. They cannot conceive that other people have thoughts, and those thoughts might be different to theirs. And this is immensely problematic in trading. You have to consider this notion. What happens if I'm wrong? Yes, I have this great narrative. I have this great story. I have wonderful charts that I've made up. But what happens if they're all completely wrong and everyone else is right? What do I do? And since we're talking about the end of the world and particularly the end of markets, it's worth looking at a little bit of history. Once again, we come back to this notion that you need to be a student of market history. And by history, I do not mean what happened last week. I mean what happened 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, 500 years ago. The question is why? Well, because history teaches you the patterns repeat, humans repeat, and that markets seem to have an ecology and order that is based upon human psychology. And this is just a simple graphic that shows historical bull and bear markets on the S&P 500. There are two important points. Bull markets last longer and go harder. Bear markets have an initial sharp, nasty phase, but they don't last as long. That's just a function of the way the world works. There is a caveat here that we have to be careful of, and it's a caveat I always mention when we talk about indices. Indices represent a basket of weighted entities that can drive the market in ways that are unexpected and are not reflected in your portfolio. Just because an index goes up does not mean your stocks go up. It means the stocks in the index has gone up, but more appropriately, it means that some very big stocks in the index have gone up a bit. So we always need to be a little bit careful. I said I would talk about this chart comparing time periods because it is a chart that I find immensely annoying and it does not seem to want to die. And there are flaws in the way people do it. What people do is they overlay one over another and they go, see, they look the same, so they are the same. Well, I could put two cars next to one another and their shadow would be the same, but they're not the same. What I've done here is I've looked back 295 weeks from crash backwards for 1929, 1987, 2007, the GFC, 2020, the COVID dump, and I've put in today where the market is today. And you look at it and you go, it doesn't look like I thought it would look. Well, it doesn't look that way for two reasons. One, I've normalised the data and I've assumed that for each one you invested a dollar at the beginning of the time period and let it go. The other is the starting period. All comparisons in markets are time dependent. They are incredibly wedded to the period you look at and the time you start from. Slight alterations in time periods make a dramatic difference in the way comparisons look, but also in the end result you get in terms of the investment. So you need to be aware of that. And the two most dramatic here are 1929 and 1987. Those bull markets were dramatically more powerful than previous ones. And you can see today the market's sort of meandering. And this is based upon the Dow because I only have data going back 120 years for the Dow. The S&P 500 did not exist back then. So if you to overlay today over 1987, they don't look the same. They look quite dramatically different. Again, a function of normalising the data instead of just plonking one over the other like you're doing a tracing, and time periods. 
And they're two things that are never mentioned. And I could be cynical and say they're never mentioned because they don't fit the narrative, but it's always easier to default to people being stupid. People who create these sort of charts that are overlay simply don't understand that that's what you need to do with data. But since we're talking about the end of the world, I thought I would talk about how you prepare for the end of the world. And it's not by building a bunker in your backyard. And the two I want to look at are 1929 and 1987. Simply because they're the two most ferocious. And there's some points I want to highlight. And once again, people will go, damn, look, they, they look the same. It's the same. No, go back and just replay the last two minutes, please. The points I want you to note are markets peak before they crash. Many people think that what happens is you go to bed on Friday and the all ordinary sits at, let's say, 7,500 points. You wake up on Monday morning and it instantly opens at 3,000 points. That's not what happens. Markets tell you everything. So we come back to one of the key points of this. All you have to do is listen. Forget your story. Listen to the story the market is telling you. Your story is an irrelevancy. So we can see here both 1929-1987, market actually peaks a good six, seven weeks before the crash unfolds. The blue box shows you that the market retraces and gives you a second chance to get out. It then begins to fall away, but you're still given a chance to get out. Markets offer you opportunities to undertake any activity you want. As someone who was in markets in 1987, they gave people fair warning and they gave people an opportunity to get out. Every time the market opened and dipped, it would say to you, do you wish to leave, yes or no? It would then ask you the same question repeatedly throughout the day and the ensuing days. Most people, unfortunately, simply said no. If we look at a, a longer term view <clears throat> and we look at what happened immediately post the market falling apart, they still look similar. Markets have this catastrophic fall. They then bounce a little bit and meander. But it's here that the similarity ends. When we look at 1929 and 1987, we see two starkly different responses. First thing I want you to concentrate on is the blue horizontal line on both. In 1929, post the crash, it took the market 26 years to make a new all-time high. Post-87, it took two years. The question automatically arises as to why. And the answer is simple. Different regulatory re regimes, different oversights, different central bank intervention. Central bank intervention in 1929, or the lack thereof, led to the Depression. But intriguingly, even as the Depression was unfolding, the Dow recovered 340% from its low. You add into the fact there that the Second World War obviously did not help. And you have a recipe for a market that simply has no impetus to really go anywhere in the very long term. But it comes back to this notion there are still opportunities. Even as the world seemed to be ending during the Great Depression, and it did seem to be ending for many, uh, people talk about how hard things are now. Uh, once again, go and have a look at history. The market put on 340%. And there were similar gains from 1942 to 45, 46, from the midpoint of the Second World War to when it ended in 45. 1987 was a different regime. 
the world was different, and that's reflected in the fact that markets responded so quickly to what was occurring in terms of the bigger economic picture. But it's always interesting to look at individual stocks. It's, as I said before, it's somewhat, I won't say misleading, but it's an incomplete picture to talk about what an index does during these events. So I picked two US stocks initially, Morgan Stanley, Salomons, because stocks that are hypersensitive to financial crashes are finance stocks. These were two broking houses and their livelihood depended upon the fact that they were coming out of a bull market where every bugger and his uncle was buying and selling shares. And you can see you're still given a chance to get out. The stocks peak before the crash. And in fact, Morgan Stanley makes a lovely double top and then breaks down. It's telling you a story. Salomon's does something slightly different. It does not form a double top, but it has this wonderfully indecisive gap up, which then sets about filling. But you'll also note that Morgan Stanley recovered quite quickly and by 1991 was making new highs, or new relative highs, uh, Salomon's took considerably longer. And if we have a quick look at a longer term chart of the two, you can see this differential in time to recovery. But you'll also see we come back to this point again. Markets present opportunity, yes, but sudden shocks in markets are problematic. But the point I will make is if you have a stop, then this is not an issue. You simply let the market wash over you, your portfolio is cleaned out, you preserve the bulk of your capital, you go away and you do something else until opportunities present themselves again. And you can see that post the crash, Morgan Stanley tripled, as did Salomon's. So opportunities abound. And to look at this from a local perspective, and I, I've picked the GFC because that is, that, that is more recent in people's memories, and it seems to be the one that these uh, do merchants are focusing on. This is ANZ and BHP. And the pattern looks suspiciously like Morgan Stanley and Salomon's from 1987. You get fair warning. The market says to you, when it opens, do you wish to leave, yes or no? And every time a trade goes through, every iteration of price is the implied question, do you wish to continue to participate, yes or no? And unfortunately, that question causes many people to vapor lock. And they're unable to answer it because within their strategy and within their mindset, they cannot conceive of this notion that markets go down, that stocks go down. And they can, as we have seen, take many, many years to recover. And this is something we witnessed post the GFC. Many heavyweights took years to recover. And so if you're sitting there waiting, you are wasting all the opportunities that came along post the GFC. And you need to be aware that there's an opportunity cost to simply uh, sitting on your ass doing nothing. So if there is a point to all of this, other than most of the things you see on the internet are wrong, it is that markets are opportunity generating engines. That's their job. Every time they open, they present opportunities. It is your job to decide what you want to do with that opportunity. Do you wish to go long? Do you wish to go short? Do you wish to stand aside? And that's the job of a market. If I were to ask someone with an MBA, what is the function of markets such as ours, they would say, well, there's one of several functions. Uh, they can be a capital raising mechanism for companies, 
or they can be a pricing mechanism to value companies in advance of capital raising. They give investors a chance to ascribe a value to a business, to which I would say bollocks. That's bullshit. That's not what they do. The job of a market is to enrich you. That, that's the only purpose it has. And it does so by presenting you with opportunities. And I want to finish on this quote. And it's a quote by Louis Pasteur. And it is, in the fields of observation, chance favours only the prepared mind. And I would like to insert a word there and change it a little bit. So that the quote becomes, in the fields of observation, chance favours only the prepared open mind. If you have a narrative that is locked in on a single point, a single belief system, something you are desperate to prove to yourself as being correct, then chance will pass you by, as will the opportunities that the market presents on a daily basis. Before you go, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel so we can keep bringing you new and unique content.